our second and last verse. happy all the day you can remain standing I'm kidding <laughs> uh, you can be seated tonight good song tonight I, I'm thankful for that song I don't know if I'm happy all the day but I'm glad tonight to be a Christian and I'm glad to know the Lord and I'm thankful tonight that we can come to him and come in his presence each and every day with thanksgiving and have grateful hearts but there's times we're human and there's times we just fail to do that but I'm thankful tonight for forgiveness I'm thankful tonight for the fact that our God's a forgiven God. You'll see that uh, hopefully tonight. Now, uh, I know a lot of folks go over for the teen group and the Masters Club group, but uh, Lord willing, we've been praying about it, and uh, we're going to start a new series of messages tonight uh, on a actual uh, chapter of the book of Psalms. I've preached, probably like most preachers have, uh, periodically verse here or there from Psalm 51, but we're going to break down that whole psalm over the next few Wednesday nights, and we're going to be doing a series of messages entitled Getting Back to God. And what you're going to find of the 150 psalms in the Bible, all of them are important, but Psalm 51 is one of those psalms that should strongly interest every single one of us that are Christians because it's our personal warning from God. You know, those people that we're on that bridge yesterday that collapsed. A lot of those people would have liked to have a little more warning before that bridge fell. But you know what? God is gracious enough and loving enough to warn all of us as his people. Amen? Of what we need to do when we do get away from him. And sometimes just because we're sitting on a church pew don't mean that we're right with the Lord. And I hope tonight that you'll follow along with us. We'll actually be in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 primarily tonight. But the next few Wednesday nights, we're going to be breaking down Psalm 51 and uh, deal with the subject of getting back to God as Christian people. So hope you'll follow along with us. Pray for us in the few, few Wednesdays that we'll deal with that. Uh, I do want to say praise the Lord. We had good Monday night service over at North Point here at the Assisted Living Nursing Home Monday night. Uh, Brother Greg, myself, and Sister Keisha, and uh, Tanya uh, went over. We had, what, Brother Greg, 24, 25 residents that came in. And uh, that was one of those services where they wanted singing and more singing and preaching and more preaching. Amen. And uh, that was a sweet service to be in Monday night over there. And we were excited about that. And uh, we actually had communion service. First time. I've done a lot of nursing homes over the years. But we arranged it to have communion service uh, with those folks Monday night. 
and uh, dealt with the resurrection of Christ and sung songs about that, and it was just a real blessing. I do want to say, too, we added that same nursing home to our church schedule, but this time we added it on the second Monday night uh, of each month at 6.30 for the teen group. Brother Daniel and the teens that come on Mondays on the second Monday night each month will be going over there to minister and sing to the same people at the nursing home. So you pray for them. We'll still stay with the same schedule, fourth Monday night for the church, but the second Monday night will be our teen group. So we we'll praise the Lord for that. So pray for them in the days to come. What we plan to do is on our screens and stuff is each month we'll, we'll start posting uh, who's going to be speaking and singing at the different nursing homes in our ministries. So pay attention to that on the screens if you can. And uh, you don't have to be a scheduled singer, but you can go and be a blessing. I wasn't a scheduled singer Monday night, but Lord laid on my heart and we sung, didn't we, Brother Greg? Amen. And they didn't throw psalm books at us. Amen. Nobody threw false teeth at us. We had a good time and rejoiced in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I do want to say on a serious note tonight, we've got some prayer requests we'll be mentioning here in just a few moments uh, once the teens head out to, to do their ministry across the, across the way here. But got a lot of needs within our church. Got some announcements we'll save at the end. We had a Boosters Club meeting here last night for the school with our upcoming barbecue fundraiser coming up in April. And I've uh, got some information we'll share on that tonight. But let's go to the Lord first of all in prayer. Let's seek him. Then we'll sing some of the choir. Got some specials. And then tonight we'll be in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12 for the message. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, thank you for coming on a rainy day. It's the day the Lord's made, and the Bible says rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's seek him in prayer tonight. And uh, Brother Jason Ferris, will you mind opening us up in prayer, please? Yes. Yes. Yes, Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. You give a listen to the choir tonight as we sing.
Amen. Somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit out there. Amen. <laughs> Something anyway. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad he'll hold my hand. Amen. Amen. And uh, down here in this life, sometimes it's hard to find anybody to be willing to hold your hand during difficult times and hard times of life. As parents, sometimes you want to hold the hand of your child uh, while they're little, help cross the road and different things that they might do. Uh, but as they get older, unless they want to reach out to grab your hand. Say amen right there. Uh, but uh, amen. Yeah, I'd preach there tonight. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I'm glad the Lord will hold our hand. Uh, he'll hold our hand in sickness and trial and difficulties. But biblically, I believe he'll hold our hand as we cross over into the next life as a child of God. Amen. Good singing tonight. That's an old song there, boy. That's a, that don't get old, but it's an old song. I'm glad that. I'm glad for that truth tonight. You give a listen tonight as Cassie sings a couple songs for us. I've come too far to look back again. There is nothing behind me All the pleasures that I used to love They have all faded from view There's a new day ahead for me All of my heartache is over For I left them at Calvary where my new life began I've come too far to look back My feet have walked through the valleys I've climbed mountains, crossed rivers Desert places I've known Oh, but I'm nearing the home shore Sing, and heaven's angels are singing I've come too far to look back Look around, there's unhappiness Some see no reason for living Cause life can give you a broken dream Full of heartaches and fears But turn around, don't look back again Just face the new day before you Place your heartache in Jesus' hands And He will mend your broken dreams I've come too far to look back My feet have walked through the valley And I've climbed mountains, crossed rivers Desert places I've known Sure, the redeemed are rejoicing. Heaven's angels are singing. I've come too far to look back. Oh, but I'm nearing the home shore. The redeemed are rejoicing. Heaven's angels are singing. I've come too far to look back.
table in a borrowed manger. He borrowed a lunch to feed a lot of strangers. He borrowed a cold to ride into town on. He borrowed a tomb, oh, but he didn't need it long. And the only thing he bought was me. When he shed his blood on Calvary, and now redeemed by his blood, for eternity, yes, the only thing he bought was me. On the auction block of sin, this old world had turned me down and Satan had told me you are nothing but hell bound he said you're never gonna win and your soul's forever lost but then I heard how Jesus paid it all on that old rugged cross and the only thing he bought was me when he shed his blood on Calvary and now redeemed by his blood for eternity yes the only thing he bought was me forgiven and forgotten my sins they're all gone cause I've been bought by the blood of the one who owns it all and the only thing he bought was me he shed his blood on Calvary, now redeemed by his blood for eternity. Oh, the only thing he bought was me. Yes, the only thing he bought. that say amen. amen and uh bible says that we're not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from our vain conversation received by the traditions of men but, but with the precious blood of christ Lord. the lamb without spot without blemish i don't think we'll ever fully grasp that until we get to heaven and we finally get in his presence for real down here we get in a good church service or we get in the presence of the lord maybe in our prayer closet or in a time of reading of the word of god or for a brief moment, for a brief moment, maybe in the car. But when you get to heaven, you'll be in his presence forever. And you're in his presence now. It's just sometimes we get too distracted with too many other things that takes precedence over that. But boy, when we get to heaven one day, it'll be continual praise. That's why I like to try to stay tuned up down here. I don't want to be caught off guard too bad when he comes. Amen. I hope you'll keep in mind Sunday morning. Sunday morning, make plans to come out. Uh, if y'all did this, it's been a long time. I've, I've been talking to people here that have been coming here since Noah parked the ark on Ararat. And uh, 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 what, one time? One time. And, and look, I don't know how it's going to go Sunday, but if we get out there in the right spirit on Sunday morning and, uh, and we're out there to praise the Lord, 
God will show up out there at the cemetery just as good as he will in here. Amen. Amen. Might show up a little more. And that mail's here reminds you if you look over your shoulder where you could be. <laughs> See, man, right there. Uh, but uh, we want to get out there Sunday morning and praise the Lord. You don't know who's going to be riding by the road that might stop, pull in, at least slow down a little bit and say, what are them people doing over there? And you live in a world today where everybody's got you on some kind of video somewhere. Whether you want to be or not, somebody in this room, you're over in Thailand somewhere and don't even know it. Uh, but uh, Sunday morning, we'll meet out there at 7 o'clock, right there just where the new rose garden is being planted at. And uh, we'll get right there in that general area. Brother Greg will have some songs picked out, and we'll sing. And maybe give a testimony a few and just read some scripture. Won't be out there real long, but we want to be out there long enough to, to be in the presence of the Lord and, and rejoice in the good things of the Lord. And we'll build off of that. Uh, I love being part of something like that. And that'll be for the early risers now. If you hadn't, if you ain't got but one eye open by 7 o'clock, you're not going to make it. Okay? Uh, uh, but if you, if you can get out, I won't even ask you to raise your hand. I'm about to look around the room and tell who's breathing by 7 o'clock. Uh, but if you're able to and can get up, you come be a part of it. But don't grieve what the rest of us will be doing. Now you just come on 11 o'clock service like you normally would and be ready to rejoice in the Lord at 11. Okay? We won't hold it against you if you don't come at 7. But don't hold it against us if we do come at 7. All right? So we'll balance that out. God be the glory. Okay? All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and take a few prayer requests tonight. We've got some praise reports. You've got a brief word of testimony. We'll take those uh, at this time. I think I'll save these other announcements for the end of the service tonight. Anybody over to my right tonight? You have a, a prayer request, praise report, or brief testimony? Anybody? Amen. 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 Sure was. And I appreciate your help the other night, too, over there. Anybody else over here? Brother Rick? Amen. Amen. Let's remember Brother Rick in prayer. Anybody else over here? Amen. Amen, Ray. Amen. It's good. Anybody else over here? All right. How about in the middle tonight? All right. Over here. Amen. Let's definitely remember that. If, and if y'all get any more information gathered on that, if there's some help there, you never know. People need clothing and other things during times like that. Mike can be a, a little reach out through the church here if you can give me a little more information. Anybody else over here, Linda? Yeah. But Todd? Amen. Danny? Okay. Anybody else over here? Remember all those on our shut-in list for sure. I do want to mention Diane and Doris. I talked with um, with um, Diane on the way to church tonight. And Doris, she had failed again yesterday. She failed today. And uh, Lord sent by uh, an insurance man, though. She had been in the floor, and Diane couldn't get her up. And uh, that man just come up out of nowhere. I believe that was a godsend for him. and was able to help get her up. But uh, they took her to Wesley Long Hospital to run some more tests with her. Uh, that's all I know at this time. They're probably going to keep her. Uh, we had actually, Stephanie and I had actually planned to go out to their house Friday night. They were going to have a little birthday celebration for her birthday's tomorrow. And if you think of it, reach out there. She'll be 95 years old, Lord willing, tomorrow. So if you would remember Diane and Doris, they're having a tough time right now. Of course, uh, reached out to Sister Deborah Bullens today. A lot of you know that uh, we put a little something on our church Facebook page this morning to pray for her with the eye surgery, and she had that today, and that went well. And uh, she's going to be staying with some family tonight, 
and I think maybe going back tomorrow for her follow-up visit with the eye and then uh, going out of town for a couple days with her family. So if you would remember Deborah in prayer, of course, and then continue to pray for Jeff and Lisa uh, Richardson, lift them up to the Lord as well, and pray for the needs within our church family here. A lot of us have different battles, different things we're facing, family members of, of, uh, that we have, uh, some of you missing lost loved ones. I hope you'll stay burdened for that. I've been trying to get that across to my Sunday school class over the last few weeks. You know, we can talk about souls being saved. We can have gospel tracts at the church. But if we don't have a burden to do anything with it, it'll just be there. And uh, you're sitting on a pew tonight because somebody was burdened for your soul. Amen. And so we've got every means possible in today's society with technology and ways to travel to spread the gospel of Christ. Uh, right over here to the left, you're welcome to any of them. We've got, we've got a few thousand John and Roman Bibles in there. We got rid of quite a few on Monday night at the nursing home. So any of you that do the nursing home ministries, keep that in mind. Get them in the hands of people. We got 66 books here. Uh, some people would love to just get one book of this. And uh, the book of John itself is enough to save the whole world if people read it. Amen. And so we're blessed. We've got a lot to be thankful for tonight just in the Word of God itself. Amen. Any other prayer requests or praises tonight before we pray? All right. If you want to take just a moment and pray with us around the altar or there at your pew, we'll take time to do that. And, of course, again, if you want to get one of the prayer list sheets and pray over a few of the needs there at the altar, you can do that as well. I do want to say while people are coming down, appreciate the prayer groups that gather every service and get together before the service and, and, and pray for a lot of these needs that we mention on Wednesdays and Sundays. And uh, let's, let's keep that in mind and have a spirit of prayer. Okay, keep that in mind if you can get anything new to Sister Wanda or take anything old off the prayer list, okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and uh, let's seek his will. Father God, thank you for the day. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for heaven, our eternal resting place. Lord, until then, Lord, you've left us down here in this world, and some days it has a lot of problems. And some days, Lord, we have a lot of burdens that get too heavy for us to bear. And Lord, I'm thankful tonight for Christian people to help bear our burdens, Lord, as we come tonight in prayer, many of the people around these altars or on these pews are, Lord, helping to do just that, to bear one another's burdens. Lord, sometimes the burdens get more than what a friend can help us with. And Lord, that's when we need to make sure that we've given them to that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Lord, I pray tonight, God, your sweet spirit would lead, guide, and direct us tonight. Help us to stay encouraged. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you as we preach Sunday, Lord. The blessings are all around us. But help us to see you so that we might see the blessings. I'm afraid if we don't, we'll see the burdens and never see you or the blessings. I pray tonight, God, your sweet spirit, God, would strengthen our faith in the days to come. Holy Spirit, guide us, lead us, direct us. Lord, help us as a church body to keep our focus on you. Help us to love one another, encourage one another. God, when we disagree with one another, help us to be quick to forgive. I pray tonight, God, that Every mom, every dad, uh, God, every uh, grandma and grandpa in this church, God, would be a light to their family. And God, we've all got loved ones that are perishing without Christ. And some of them, Lord, they're just a heartbeat away, just a phone call away to us that they'd step out into a Christless eternity. I pray tonight, God, you give us tears for those that are lost. Give us a burden. Put our feet to action, God, that we might go and seek to save that which is lost the way Jesus did. And I pray tonight, God, that this church would be a light in this community. Uh, God, that we would be the salt that you left us here to be. And that, God, that we would be ever moving forward with your message of salvation. Honor our prayer request tonight. Lord, there are moms and dads in the room with burdens for their children, uh, family members that are sick, some having illnesses that, Lord, the doctors can't even quite explain. But, God, our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we... We leave it in your hands. Give us faith to believe and trust it. I pray tonight, God, that you'd honor what we're trying to do with these children, the school, this Master's Club program, the teens. It's a lot to, to undertake. But, God, we pray for wisdom. We pray for strength and knowledge to do what we do. Help us in the days to come, Lord, to continue, Lord, to do what we do and reach beyond this place to a lost and dying world. Fill us with your spirit tonight, your power, your wisdom, that we might preach your word. And God, use us tonight to do great things for heaven.
Thank you again for loving us for Christ's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Our ushers will go ahead and come. We'll do our Wednesday evening offering, and then we'll be in our message tonight in 2 Samuel chapter number 11 and 12 to start with. I'll tell you, while they're getting things in place, Brother Kyle, I'll see you back there. If you'll meet me down here, Brother, at the altar, I'll go ahead and give you this baptismal certificate. I know you had to work over the weekend. I appreciate you being here tonight, man. And... Uh, <clears throat> Praise the Lord for him stepping out and getting baptized Amen. last Wednesday night. Amen. 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 Brother Greg, what page are we singing? Page 109. Page 109. Let's all stand one more time, give you a chance to stretch your legs for the home stretch. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give back to you tonight. Lord, if we are not able to give financially, help us to give back our time and our talents, our abilities, Lord, our gifts that you've given us and use it for your glory. Thank you again for each person on the sound of this roof. Pray that they be blessed tonight through the singing, through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Page 109, send the light. First, second, and last verse. There's a call comes ringing all the restless waves. Send the light. Send the light. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. All right. Take your Bible, 2 Samuel chapter number 12. I think to kind of lay the groundwork for what we're going to be dealing with over the next few Wednesday nights together, I want to read to you 2 Samuel chapter 12. You won't have to raise your hand, but if you ain't got any Bible reading in this week, here's your chance to get a few verses tonight, okay? I want us to understand this. Some of you have been saved some time. You understand the story well. Some of you maybe have not read this, but I want you to see some truths with us tonight as we build on this subject of getting back to God. Our message tonight is actually going to be our response to God. I want you to notice what 2 Samuel chapter 12 says. I want to read down through verse number 23. I'll save comments for when we get into the message, but I want you to see this. The Bible said, And the Lord, the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and the Bible said, he came unto him and said unto him. He said, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeded many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. He said, and there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for that wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. The Bible said here, and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, 
The man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore. I want you to mark this in your Bible. We're going to deal with this a little bit here in a moment. David said he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Probably be a good idea to underline that too. Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives, and thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if they had been too little, he said, I would more have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore, as thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword, and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And verse 10 is another verse that's worth recognizing. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thy own house, and will Take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For thou didst secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, and before the sun. In verse 13, David said unto Nathan, would you mark this, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed in his own house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose, went to him to raise him up from the earth, Bible says here, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. It came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child's dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, he perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Look at our last few verses here. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came to the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me, that the child may live? And boy, here's a very important verse. But now as he did, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? David said, I don't believe I can do that. He said, but I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Let us pray. Father, help us tonight, Lord, as we begin to dissect these verses over the coming weeks, as we look to Psalm 51 during a time of David's restoration from sin. And I just ask you tonight, God, to use us for the next few moments. Lord, you'll honor your word. You don't have to honor me, but I pray you'd honor your word tonight and use me to be a spokesman. And I just pray tonight, God, you'd fill us with your spirit, give us wisdom. Lord, open our mouth, our mind, our thoughts, open our hearts, that God, we might receive from you. Lord, the world tries its best to wear us out in our minds and our bodies. I pray tonight, God, you renew us and strengthen us tonight through your word. We love you. Thank you again for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. All God's people said, amen. Amen. I want to start out in our introduction tonight by saying this. The only place we're going to find safety, Christian, in the days to come is in the hands of the Lord. You're going to find safety. You're going to find satisfaction. You're going to find strength 
in the presence of God. 2 Samuel chapter number 12, David is now king of Israel. I want to I paint a little picture tonight before we look at some of these truths. David's been living in a place of privilege. If you remember, he started out a little shepherd's boy. He started out a poor boy. He started out on a hillside looking after his daddy's sheep, didn't he? Very humble young man. But now, David has been living a life of privilege for quite some time. That life of privilege with it has a lot of temptation. The more privilege you get in life, the more you're going to deal with these kind of temptations. He's far from the young man that humbly cried out, if you'll go to Psalm 18, keep your place there in 2 Samuel, and there's some passages I want you to look at with us tonight in our study. I want you to go to uh, to Psalm 18. Uh, By the time you get to 2 Samuel 12 and then Psalm 51, David is far from the young man that, that cried out the words that you see here in Psalm 18 in the first three verses. Notice what he says in these verses. He, he's a younger man, a man that, that is dependent on God. He's a young man that's in battle. We're going to talk about that in a moment as well. I'm going to tell you there's a difference when you're facing battles versus when you're living in leisure. In Psalm 18, David's been in battles. He's concerned. Unless God shows up, unless God protects him, he's not going to make it from the enemy. And notice what he says here in verse number 1 in Psalm 18. He said, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. I want you to notice all the times he uses the word my in these verses. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I'll trust. He said, he's my buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. He said, I'll call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved, he said, from mine enemies. So the man that you're reading about in 2 Samuel 12 has been a man of privilege now for a few years. The man you're reading after in Psalm 18 is a young man that is, that is on the run for his life. And, and unless God protects him, he's going to die somewhere. You see the difference tonight? 2 Samuel, if you'll go back there, chapter 11 and 12, it gives us the background for what we're going to study and what we're going to see next week starting in Psalm 51 and the serious subject that was involved. If you read all 150 Psalms, I said this a moment ago when we started out our church service, if you read all 150 Psalms found in the Bible, all of them are important to us. Amen? But Psalm 51 is one that should strongly interest all of us that are Christian people that are saved because it's our own little personal warning from God. It's a warning from God of what we need to do when we need to get back to God. And it's so easy. I didn't say lose your salvation, but it's so easy to begin to walk away from God as a Christian. It's easier than what you realize. And we're going to see that tonight uh, in, in our study. I want you to go to Galatians chapter 6, but keep your place there in 2 Samuel as we'll come back in just a moment. And in Psalm 51, you're going to find uh, uh, David as a man that had walked with God, a man that was blessed by so many people, but yet a man that fell quickly into sin. But in Psalm 51, you find that David is going to be restored to fellowship with God. And that's so important because look what your Bible says in Galatians chapter number 6. This is why we should always take heed lest we fall. It's real easy to get that Baptist mentality of shoot them while they're down. Amen. Kick them a little harder while they're down. I, I knew they'd get out. It's real easy to have that Pharisaical mindset. Again, just because I show up to every church service doesn't mean I'm where I need to be with God in life. Amen. Amen? The Bible says here in Galatians 6, look at verse number 1, brethren, that's saved people, Christian people. He said, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, if a man gets in a position that David finds himself in, if somebody, watch, at True Gospel Baptist Church gets in a bad way spiritually, notice what the scripture says. Ye which are spiritual. If you're not thinking spiritual minded, you'll do more harm than good. When somebody hasn't been on the church pew in a while, 
When someone has got out in known public sin, when someone has messed up their marriage, when they've messed up their testimony, the Bible says only let spiritual minded people deal with that. People that are gossiping, people that are carnal, (laughs) people that think they're the only one that hasn't sinned since they got saved, Them's not the ones to sin, the Bible says. Notice now, he said, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. He said, and while you're doing the restoring, while you're setting the bones, so to speak, while you're helping them spiritually to know that we still love you down at True Gospel Baptist Church. He said, while you're doing that, go ahead, notice, and consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You better always think about, man, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be in the same boat they're in. Amen. Look at here. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, the Bible said he deceiveth his own self. Man, don't ever get to the point where you think you've arrived and you got it all figured out and you you know what every book of the Bible teaches and you live this verse here every day and you live that verse every day and that had not ever happened to you and this won't ever happen to me. No, it'll happen next week. Notice the Bible said, If a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. But let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, that's a lot of good preaching there in those verses, but I, I've given you enough of that to understand where I'm coming from with 2 Samuel 11, 12, and Psalm 51 over the next few Wednesday nights. Now, look back at 2 Samuel 12, and let's look at verse 5 and 6. By the time that, that the preacher shows up down at the palace, David is already in a mess. This has been going on for quite some time. By the, time, by the time the preacher shows up, this has been going on for, for about a year now. now. Now picture that, a year away from God's a long time. Five minutes away from God's too long. But buddy, when you stretch it out to a year, you, you're doing a lot of deception. Notice what your Bible says here in 2 Samuel 12. Look at verse 5 and 6 as we pick apart just a few of these verses again. The Bible said, and David's anger was greatly kindled. Remember, the preacher's giving him that little sad story about that rich man and that poor man, and that, that poor man had only one little lamb. He looked after it, he loved on it, and he'd, he'd done everything he could to, to, to bring it up and protect it. And then that rich man, boy, he had all kinds. And then that rich man had a, a, a friend come over, instead of taking one of his lambs, uh, he took the poor man's lamb. Boy, David's all into that story. He's listening in. He's sitting there thinking, man, his anger is boiling. Look what it says in verse 5. His anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that have done this thing shall surely die. Just give his name and I'll I'll send the soldiers out to get him today. Look at verse 6. And he shall restore the lamb. I asked you to mark this a while ago. Fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now look at verse 7. And Nathan said to David, I'm looking at him. I don't need to go get anybody. You don't need to send the soldiers out. You're the guy I'm talking to. How about that? Boy, we need people like that in life. Amen. Amen. Well, he says in verse number 10, we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine own house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Now, look at verse number 12. For thou didst sit secretly, he said, but I'll do this thing before all Israel, and before the Son, he said. But notice verse 13. This is where I drew our message from tonight. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. That's that's David's response to God. Remember I told you our, our, our series is going to be getting back to God Well, if we're ever going to get back to God, we got to follow what David is doing here, and you got to be willing to respond to God before you'll ever get back to God. You'll find yourself maybe not quite as bad as David, but you're going to find along this Christian life, there's going to be times you're going to need to get back to God. And the longer you go, 
the more difficult it's going to get. Because your old nature is going to kick in once again. To, I, I don't mean this ugly because I got the same problem. The sorry side of you. The sorry side of you don't want church. It don't want Bible. It don't want prayer. It don't want family devotion. It don't want to love people at this church. That's the side of you. If you let it have its way, it'll get you just as bad as off as David is. Though you're saved. But David said, his response is, I have sinned against the Lord. It's right there. It's, I marked that in my Bible. I put a couple of stars in my Bible because it's right there. It's right there that David begins his way back to God. Let's remember, let's remember just who this man was. <laughs> who was he, preacher? He's the one that God said, I have found me a man finally that's after my own heart. Now, now picture that. There's been a lot of good men, but God never said that about any man in the Bible before David or since David. Has there been some good men? Sure it was. Noah was a good man. Enoch was a good man. And we could go on and on in the Old Testament. There were good men, men that sold out to God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all these men were good men that had sold out to God. But buddy, when God looked out on the hillside and saw that little ruddy-faced teenage boy out there playing that harp and just seemed like he had a love in his heart for the things of God and he wanted to be what God wanted him to be in life, God said, boy, it's about time that there's a young man that's been raised up that's got the same heart that I got tonight. Amen. That's the man that David was. He was the one that Samuel came out and anointed in front of all of his older brothers and let the oil of God run down over his head. And Samuel said, hey, there's the man that's going to be the next king of Israel. By the way, he's the same man that killed the bear, killed the lion on the hillside to protect his daddy's sheep. He's the same one that walked down in the valley of Elah one day uh, uh, with a little sharp shooting sling in his hand and some smooth stones that he got out of the brook and some faith in God. I said some faith in God tonight. And he watched God uh, as he slung that little slate. Look, they could have blindfolded David and he could have turned around and been eating a, 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 eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and that stone would have still went right into the forehead of Goliath. Amen. That thing went right between his eyes. He's the same one that took Goliath's sword when he hit the ground and raised up and chopped off the head of a nine and a half foot crackhead giant. He's the one that when he finished the job, the women began to sing as he come into town. King Saul has slain his thousands, but David his Ten thousands. He's the one that wrote the majority of our beloved Psalms. Uh, he's the one that sat out on the hillside, Brother Todd, one day and wrote Psalm 23 and said, The Lord is my shepherd. Uh, I shall not want. That's the same guy. But he's the one. He's the one that's going to have to now respond to God after his sins found him out. Let me pause there. Everybody in the room, we have the same story. Everybody's story is the same. You say, preacher, what do you mean? It's all how you respond to God when you mess up. And you will. Some of us mess up a little bit. Some of us mess up a lot. But we all got the same story. That's why none of us are any better than the other. We, we, we all got the same story. It's, it's how you respond to God in these moments. See, your story is about you and God. My story is about me and God. Other people, here's where people mess up. People mess up in life, and they want to pull this one in, and they want to pull this one in, and they want to pull that one in, and somehow or another, because I'm right here, it's these people's fault. You with me? It's this one's fault. If, I, if they wouldn't have told me to do that, it's this one's fault. If they wouldn't have had me watch that, it's this one's fault. If they wouldn't have shown up and told me to go... No, no, no. Look, it, 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 there's where we mess up. It, it, there may be other people involved in the events of our lives, but the story, the story of our lives is between God and us. Now let me ask you a question. In the quietness of your heart, answer this question before the Holy Ghost. 
How is it honestly tonight with God and you? Though you're on the pew, and I'm glad you're here, night's one of them nights I'd probably just preach to this podium here. But you're here. Some of you I knew you'd be here because you've been here every service since I've been here. And I commend you for it. But just because you're here doesn't mean you're where you need to be with God. Ask yourself honestly. And it'd help all of us to every day say, Lord, where am I at honestly with you? Are you with me? See, we allow ourselves to get in positions to where we want to blame people. We want to blame events for the wrong places and the wrong things that we are doing in our lives. But it always comes down to how we respond to God. It comes down to how is things between God and me. Look again at 2 Samuel 12. You see, in this chapter, this is where we find David. He's been a man with a heart for God. He's a sweet psalmist of Israel. He's a kind man. He's been a humble man. He's been a compassionate man. He's a, he's a wonderful man. Would you agree with me tonight? He's the kind of man you would have wanted to know. He's the kind of man, if he wasn't wearing the royal crown around his head and on the throne of Israel, he is the kind of man we would have put in as a deacon. We'd have said, hey, boy, there's a fine Sunday school teacher. We'd have him ushering. We'd have him involved at this church. He was admired by so many people. He was looked up to by so many people, respected by people. A man that you would never think would commit such a horrific sin. His life, for over a year, turned from all those good traits, look at me, to now he's a man, watch how quick we turn, lust, Lies, cover-ups, getting a man drunk, and now murder. And anger to go with it. You put lust and lies and cover-ups and anger and murder together, you got an animal. Man, you remember Sunday night? The few of you that said amen. You remember Sunday night when I was talking about how we need women in society? You remember the women were throwing their bonnets and stuff and their hairpins while I was preaching that? <laughs> you leave us men to ourselves, we get as bad if not worse. Amen. Men, we're a danger to society when we're not where we need to be with God. You don't believe me? You watch and see how more and more the sex traffic and mess is going to keep growing. You show me any grown man that'll take a 9, 10 year old girl and do unthinkable things to that child and seem to enjoy that, that is a demonic animal. Do you understand me tonight? I'm, I'm within the confines of Scripture and in the right spirit in what I'm saying tonight. But we got a sin, sick, demonic, devilish society when you can harm little innocent children and seem to enjoy it and pay millions of dollars for it. David is a man after God's own heart. He's a man that is loved by everybody in Israel. And all of a sudden, David is lusting. David is lying. David is covering up. He's murdering. He's full of anger. But let me help us all out tonight. If David could commit such sins, uh, then you mark it down. Mark Smith's capable of the same. And you're capable of the same. And the greatest person you ever met in your life is capable of the same. All, look, I hope... I I hope tonight we're all careful how we point the finger at people like David and like other people that have messed up tonight because I'm telling you if it wasn't for the grace of God, Brother Greg, and the mercy of God and the Spirit of God, I'd be in the same bad way they are. Amen. 
I hope you look at this just as easily, if not more easily tonight than what I'm trying to paint it in a sermon. But God help us all to have listening ears, Amen. opened hearts and praying lips. God teach me, show me, help me to stay humble. God help me for the, for the sake of my wife and my children and my little grandchildren. God, help me to be wise to the temptations that are out there in front of me every day. That's where we need to be. Would you write this down? Number one, let's understand for just a moment the actual fall of David. The actual fall of David. Now, by the time you get to 2 Samuel 11 and 12, picture this. David has been king for roughly... About 10 years. He's about 50 years old, right? About, about the age that I am. 50 years old. He's been blessed. He's a man of much wealth. That's where me and him part ways. Uh, but but uh, uh, he's a man of much wealth. He's a man of a lot of privileges. But no man on God's green earth has the privilege to break the laws of God without having to reap what you've sown. Not even David. Not even the man after God's own heart. Look, a few things to understand before we move on. Don't forget this. Our public fall is not our first fall. When we fall publicly, that wasn't the first fall. When the preacher showed up publicly a year later, that wasn't David's first fall. Can I say second of all here? Something private and something secret has to take place in our heart that only God sees in us. Did you hear what I said? Something private. That's why, look, that's why men sometimes get on privately and mess on them phones. And privately send somebody else's wife a message. Privately. Secretly, that has to take place in our heart, and only God sees that in the beginning. Family, friends, church people, they don't see it in the initial stages. Who's still with me? Number three, something happens in our daily walk with God, and at some point, in some time, our secret is then made known publicly. But it always started out privately. It started out secretly. David's public fall wasn't the first fall. Nobody saw David the day that he fell. If, how many of you like to fall down physically in front of people? It ain't no fun, is it? Yeah. There's been some people that laughed at me a little over a year ago that about failed that I've seen literally fall since they about saw me fall. Yeah. I've seen several people around here run into things and I just went around the corner and laughed at you. <laughs> now look at me. We don't like that. We blush. Oh, I didn't mean... No, no, no. Look here. David failed spiritually. But by the time the preacher showed up, it had been over a year. See, something happens in our daily walk at some point, and then the secret's made known. And that's where, that's where when, when Nathan shows up at the palace, that's where David is at. Don't, don't forget this. David could have never done all the things with Bathsheba that he did had not something first happened in his daily walk with God. You'll never be where you're supposed to be with God and this kind of stuff happen. If you were your need to be with God, you'll never be in the arms of a Bathsheba. Notice 2 Samuel 11. Look at verse 1. I'll go home and preach this again tonight to Dexter. 
Look at 2 Samuel 11. Look at verse 1. It came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, the winter season's over, the rain season's over. This is not uncommon. If there's battles to be fought, the weather's turning nicer, it's getting warmer, things are turning green, and so there's time to go out and fight a battle. And the Bible said, and David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba. But don't think bad. I've heard preachers preach this before and said it was a sin for David to stick around the palace. I don't believe that to be true. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. The reason I say that, David, David had stayed back before. He didn't go out fully into battle other times. We know that according to the Scriptures. But in the battles we do know about David that, that, that we read a moment ago in Psalm 18. In Psalm 18, David's in a battle and he's crying out from his heart, God, I need you. But what's the difference when you get to 2 Samuel 11? Look at me. It's called downtime. It's called leisure time. It's called when I can't find my Bible, but I got my phone. And I left my Bible at church. Well, call me. We'll get it. You don't need to go through four days without it. You listening? If you got to keep one here to keep somebody out of your seat, then get another one to take home. Keep the spare one here and take the one you need to be in home. If you need to put it on your dash to ward off drunk drivers, whatever you got to do, take it. Potheads, drug heads. Look. Leisure time in your life and my time, it's dangerous. Because it's during those times, look, look, men especially, listen to me, I'm not throwing rocks at us, but I'm a man like you. I'm not one of these women. How do they do it? Thank God. I live with one. Some days that's bad enough. Thank you, Jesus. I'm still married to her, though. Look. <laughs> Watch. Men, when you got downtime, that's when your mind is prone to wonder. And if you got enough downtime like David, your mind can wonder and wonder, and your mind can wonder. Too far. Look what happens. Look at verse 2. And it came to pass in the evening time that David arose off the bed and, and walked upon the roof of the king's house. What time did he get out there? Evening time. I don't know what time he got up that day, but he, he, it must have been a good day and he walked outside in the evening time from off the bed and he walked upon the roof of the king's palace. Now remember, he's a privileged man. He's a blessed man. He lives in the palace. He, everything he's got is way above everybody else. So look what the Bible says here. And the Bible said, and from the roof, he, he, I, I circled this in my Bible, he saw, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very, man, of every woman that's got to be out there on the roof. She just happens to be a beautiful woman. It wasn't one of them women where he said, my soul, what in the world? <laughs> and stagger backwards back into the palace bedroom. No. The Bible said it just happened to be. She was probably a gorgeous lady. Matter of fact, look what it says, and David sent and inquired after the woman. I don't mean this ugly, but if she only had a face her mama would love, he'd have never sent for her. She was a beautiful woman, a woman that David could not get his eyes off of, but a woman that he couldn't get his mind off of. Are you listening? And the Bible says, somebody says, whoa, David, whoa. One said, 
Somebody was brave enough to speak up to the king and one said, King, excuse me, your, your, your royalty, the highness. Think about who this woman is. It's the daughter of, it's the daughter, David, of Eliam. Eliam's not just any guy in the kingdom. He's one of David's top 37 men. He's a warrior. He's a man that will die for David if he needs to. But it doesn't stop there. David, you know that's the daughter of Eliam, but it's also the wife of Uriah the Hittite, which is another man of loyalty, which is another man that is one of the mighty men of David, another man that will willingly die without question for David. Y'all with me? But watch what your Bible says. Go, go, to, verse, go to verse number 5. The Bible says in verse number 5, And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I'm with child. Now watch how quickly things change here. As soon as the words of verse 5 hit David's ears, the cover-up began. He didn't even wait till the next day. You got to pay attention to these little things because we'll be in the same boat as David. Look at verse number six. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. Well, he knows whose wife it is. One said, don't do this. It's Uriah's wife. It's Eliam's daughter. We know later on it'll be Ahithophel's granddaughter, which was the man that in those days spoke as, as the oracles of God. He was a man that was in tune with God. And verse 6, the cover-up started and Joab sent Uriah to David. Now let's pause there. Everybody still okay? Look, look. Maybe... Brother Rick, I'm giving David the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it was just an accident that David saw Bathsheba on her rooftop. It happens to all of us. But here's the thing. Picture me being David. And I look over the rooftop and there it is right in front of me. He couldn't help it but he didn't have to look again. He saw it the first time and he's going to have to battle it in his mind even if he turns and walks now. He didn't have to look again. But he kept his eyes on her. You know why? Because he liked what he saw. He liked what he saw her doing and a sinful desire began to burn in David's heart. Now look at me. I'm saying this kindly. At that moment, a desire unleashed in David and he became a beast from within. And we're not going to know the same David for the next year. There's the beauty of the Bible. God doesn't cover up the sins of the heroes. But we learn from them. He's got a brief moment to make a decision, Brother Mike. And through the lust of his flesh and the lust of his eyes, David made a bad decision. And it all led to a wicked and ungodly plan that will forever change his home. Everybody in this room from me back needs to take heed to this. Especially every man in this room. Who knows you're a man in this room? You're not trying to identify as anything else. You're a man. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you something, men. We're living in a world of less and less clothes on people publicly. Now, I'm being sensitive to a few little ones in here, but look at me. 
It doesn't matter how many clothes a man and woman's got on if they're under the roof of their own house and the blinds are closed. But when a man or a woman gets out publicly and they're dressed no different publicly than what they would be in the confines of their bedroom, it's going to always happen. It's going to happen every time. Here's what will happen. Ladies, you'll bring it on a man and a man will fall for it. I didn't say anybody's name. I'm just saying what's in all of us. I try to be sensitive to this, not here to hurt, I'm here to help. At some point, we're all going to see something that we should never see. I don't mean this ugly. You take any 10-year-old, 9-year-old boy over here that hasn't been exposed to hardcore pornography and things that are borderline to that and you put a cell phone in a teenage boy's hand and show that 9- or 10-year-old boy that stuff, it'll forever and ever stay in his mind. It'll sizzle in his mind. And we wonder where today's predators are at and today's rapists are at and today's child molesters are at and today's serial killers. It all started with something that got in their mind and the demons of hell fed their mind and they turned into animals. At some point we're all going to see something we shouldn't see. But we don't have to turn our heads and look again. I'm going to tell you how bad it is. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, He said, you know, they, they told you in old time not to commit adultery. Jesus said, but I'm going to tell you, it's worse than that. He said, fellas, all you got to do is be at Myrtle Beach or Madison Mid, Ann. <laughs> Let's go back old school. Turn over here on K-Fort and go to Madison Beach. (laughs) Or you can be at Walmart. Or you can be at a Baptist church. As my grandpa used to say, if she ain't got on no more clothes than to clean out a shotgun barrel, she needs to go get some more. Oh, yeah. Now, look at me. What will happen in that situation is you'll find a David that was innocent and he just sinned. Jesus said, you commit adultery in your heart, watch, with her. She brought it on and you fell for it. That's good preaching, whether it's me or Yosemite Sam. This is why you'll find you need to get back to God and I need to get back to God more than we realize. Fantasy immorality is just as sinful as physical immorality. If I fantasized it in my mind, Jesus said I went ahead and slept with her. That's why we got to be careful. We, we, we point a finger at a guy that physically did it, but we did it 20 times in a year in our mind. That's, that's where David's at. David thought it in his mind and acted upon what he sought in his mind, and he went and did it physically. See, sins of the hands, who's got hands? Sins of the hands and sins of the heart, they're both the same. And for that, only the Word of God can cleanse us. Only the Word of God can wash us this way to where we're clean again. The images we fantasize with, like David, it breaks fellowship with God. And it causes us to lose our appetite 
for the things of God. There are a lot of men that can preach better than me that ruin their ministries because they saw something here and they liked what they saw and they found it again and again and again. Amen? Let me give you this in closing. Go back to chapter 11. Look your Bible says in verse number 6. And David went to Joab saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how the war prospered. I marked in my Bible, hypocrite. David's a hypocrite. Not only is he a liar, not only is he an adulterer and a deceiver, but now he's a hypocrite. David's got 37 men that are closer to him than any other people. Bathsheba's daddy, I said a moment ago, Eliam and her husband Uriah are two of those men. They were elite warriors. They were the closest men David had. Men that would have gladly gave their life for David. Men that were mighty men. Men that had the same God as David. We won't read it, but verse 8 through 11 shows us the loyalty of this man. David tries to get him drunk. The plot, the scheme is go sleep with your wife. Man, you've been on the battlefield. Go with your wife. David says, somebody give him another bottle of that, give him another bottle of that, that best wine we got. Get him drunk. He didn't go. What a guy. What loyalty. So David goes to the next plan. Try to get a good man drunk. That plan failed. But then verse 14, David gets to really writing a letter. He folds that thing up. He seals it. He hands it to Uriah. Uriah's so loyal, he don't even open it. Most of us... Let's see what the king got to say. He might have said something good about me and promote me. Oh, kill me? Put me in the hottest part of the battle? What? No, he didn't do anything but take it straight to Joab. He's carrying his own death letter. Y'all with me? He's so honest, he's so loving that he quickly leaves with his own death sentence in his, in his hand. And Uriah is sent down to the most dangerous part of the battle. And then Joab withdrew the troops. He left Uriah alone so Uriah would be killed by the enemy. Joab knew it. And David's got more problems because Joab would hold it against him the rest of his life. Now look here. David is reaching a place where Numbers 32-23 is going to show up at the door one day. And here's what it says, Christian. Be sure your sin will find you out. Sure, he says. He didn't say, maybe not if you can do this. No, no, no. You're David. Yeah, be sure. You're the preacher. Be sure. You're the deacon. Be sure. Sunday school teacher. Be sure. The guy that gives to True Gospel Baptist Church but goes home and secretly... He said, you be sure. Doesn't matter who you are. He said, you just mark it down. It's coming. For David, it took a year. But when the preacher said, you're the guy, David said, I've sinned. He could have said, get that preacher out of my palace and kill him. He's got the power to do it. 
But thank God in the midst of all the mess, there's a loving God that's still working on his heart. And though his heart has gotten hard, there's enough softness in there somewhere. And the Spirit of God spoke to his heart, Brother Kelly. David's fall started with the lust of the flesh for another man's wife that led to the lust of the eyes. I don't know where it starts with all of us, but it starts. Now look here before we stand. David got to the point where he desired Bathsheba more than he desired God. And when you ever get to the point where you desire anything more than God, you're backslidden. Didn't say you're lost, but you're backslidden. He wanted her. He burned for, had her brought to him. He enjoyed the pleasure, the Bible said, for a season. Don't forget this. Same guy that wrote Psalm 23 is the same guy that wrote a death letter to kill a good man. If David can do it, you and I can do it. But we can get back. And that's what we're going to look at next week with the help of the Lord. As we stand all over the building. Well, Jay, if you'd make your way down and, and maybe just play a little something tonight. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. We, we brought out a lot of tough stuff tonight. But stuff that shows all of us where we're at with God from time to time, man or woman. Ladies, we men respond to what we see. It's a proven fact. But a woman will respond to what she hears. See, fellas, the devil will make sure there's enough arguments during those times where you're what I call a leisure time in your life, had been in your Bible lately, hadn't prayed in a while, flipping through your phone, moving the screens, flipping through your channels, maybe even at work. Your wife ain't bought no perfume in 10 years. The new lady at work, she's got on the kind your wife used to wear. Amen. Matter of fact, she knows how to flirt with you. Something your wife ain't done in a while. Matter of fact, she likes the fact that when she walks by, you look again. That's dangerous. That's got adultery written all over it. That's got meeting somewhere on a dirt road all over it. That's getting a hotel room and covering it up. At least till God brings it to light. People do this stuff all the time. Hey, ladies, same thing. Your husband hadn't said I love you in a long time. Don't put his arm around. Don't hold your hand. Don't make you feel special like he did when you were dating. Y'all know I'm telling it right. And the devil will send some guy that looks like he's the newest casted 22-year-old for young and the restless. Matter of fact, you'll see him jogging through the neighborhood. Everything your husband used to have right here is dropped here. Or he didn't have it here to start with, but either way, this guy's got it. He got on them little skimpy shorts while he's jogging. In your little mind, you just run right through the stop sign there in the development. Run over somebody's rose bush and keep on going. But that's the way we get. Amen? See, David gave Bathsheba a few days to mourn. I believe David even worked up a hypocritical tear or two. He had to look good at the funeral. All politicians have to do that when you're at this level. But he soon slowly worked her down to the palace. And here's what good sinners do. He even justified all of this for the good of the kingdom. Amen? And the chapter ends with David thinking, we finally got it all behind us. 
Only problem is, David, God never forgot it. Amen? And one cool, soul-winning evening, the preacher that God had told to go see. Boy, imagine being Nathan. You're talking about a man that's got to have some courage. Nathan's got to have it. I don't know, Brother Scotty, if he just... Didn't sound like he hesitated. David said, you go get the guy. He's going to be in bad trouble. Preacher said, I ain't got to go nowhere. I'm looking at him. Amen? It's good stuff. But it's stuff we need, church. Amen? Thank you for playing tonight. If you study your Bible behind that, there was a fourfold judgment that would come to David's home. You'll find that God forgives, and we'll talk about that next week. But don't ever forget this. God will forgive, but there will always be a reaping with anything we sow. And we always sow, or reap rather, more than what we ever sowed. And David did through his children, through his family, through Joab, through Ahithophel. The list goes on and on. Thank God he's forgiven. We just don't know how long the wheel's going to turn before it stops. Amen? Pay attention to sermons like this. You'll need it at some point. I just hope you don't need it tonight. Amen? Keep in mind, Saturday will be the Easter egg hunt over here from 3 to 5 for the little ones, 2 to 11. And we'll have a message there at the beginning. I have some snacks and prizes and stuff for the kids. It'll be a good little time for them. Come out and support that. It's supposed to be really pretty Saturday and Sunday. And again, at 7 o'clock Sunday morning, we'll have the, the sunrise service. Also, please keep in mind, we've got these flyers out there for the golf tournament. If you're interested in participating in that or getting a sponsorship signed for $60 or get a business name put on the banner for $250, and if you'd like to know more about what that'll help do for your business, let me get with me and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit further. Or Brother Mike here, Ken, or Chris Martin, those are the guys that have helped me the most in getting that organized, and Brother Todd and a few others. And then keep in mind the summer day camp this summer uh, for small children. Uh, help us out with that or help get the word out on that. And then the last couple of things here uh, of, of remembrance. Uh, don't want to throw too many things at you, but this barbecue supper, I want you to come out for that. We'll be getting tickets. Uh, we're going to have a barbecue supper and auction on uh, April 13th at 5 o'clock. 5 to 7 over here. If you just want to do drive through pickup, that'll be from 4 to 5. If you'll see Trey back there or Sister Wanda, you can get a ticket for that. Uh, hmm? Do have a few tickets tonight. If you want one, they have run out of tickets. We'll still take your name tonight, okay? It'll tell how much the plates and stuff are. They're pre-selling the tickets. Also, if you're interested, uh, you can get a whole cooked Boston butt for $50. Got to prepay for that. See Trey as well on that or Sister Wanda. And then, of course, there's two sheets down here. We're going to be auctioning off desserts cakes. We've already got some professionally baked people that run places that do this every day. They're going to be donating. But if you got a specialty cake or you just got to pour it out of a Duncan Hines box, okay, we'll auction it. You'll be surprised what it'll go for. And then if you've got any new or like new items valued at $25 or more that's at the house and you haven't done nothing with it, Bring that in because we're going to auction, only auction that stuff. I don't want to turn it into a yard sale that take all night. Just nice specialty items. If you're not sure, see me or Wanda or Trey again on that. But sign-up sheets are down here for that kind of stuff. And I think that's the majority of what I need to mention tonight to you. Thank you for coming. And again, please take to heart what we preach tonight. It's, uh, it's a serious thing, what we're dealing with. And it's costing a lot of families and homes... And I hate to say it, but it's only going to get worse in the society in which we live. Um, 
Hope to see some of you tomorrow, teachers <laughs> uh, and kids. Tomorrow will be our last day for a few days. We'll get out for a little bit of break until Wednesday of next week, so keep that in mind as well. If you've got kids and teenagers over, be sure to get them before you leave. All right? Let's dismiss in prayer, and uh, if all hearts are clear tonight, uh, we'll dismiss. Uh, Brother Mike East, would you pray for us?